Hello and welcome to another episode of Time Extend. My name is Adam Ismail and joining me for this very important episode as always is... Brendan Norrison and sadly Adam we aren't joined by Kazunori Yamauchi. Um, unfortunately um, I did make a tweet earlier that might have alluded to that fact but it's just us TX boys back again and what an occasion it is mate. This is probably the biggest podcast we've recorded in terms of how monumental it is for the racing game, the racing genre. Um, it's Gran Turismo 7, baby. That's all we can say. <laughs> yeah, God, what if we had Kaz on? I mean, I I feel like if he knew anything about us, he would take issue with various things that we've said about his uh, his projects. But I, I don't know. I don't know what I would do. I would maybe be speechless. I actually, I have on one occasion met the man, and it was at the New York event in 2019, and I was mostly speechless. Uh, I, I just I just thanked him and shook his hand and just kind of smiled uh, vacantly, and it's like the only time in my life where that's ever happened. Me, I, I don't even know how I would act around like a guy like that, because he's not like your typical celebrity, so it's not that way where... You can have a standard celebrity reaction and he's very much a kind of cult hero for a very specific set of fans and a, a specific kind of hobby. So it's like, what do you say that doesn't make you sound like an idiot or rather what do you do? Because obviously, um, I'm not sure if he actually understands English or he just chooses to speak Japanese. But I think he understands, I think he understands a good amount. You can even see it in interviews like he he'll like nod like he seems to get it before uh, his his interpreter relays it to him Mm -hmm. Um, and also like I I have to credit uh, Jordan of GT Planet for introducing me to him because there's no way I would have approached the man uh, if I didn't have Jordan there and he was just like hey uh, Kazunori I want you to meet somebody and uh, yeah so so very thankful to uh, for for so many things Jordan is a great guy but uh, also for that I have a great picture Uh, I got a great picture out of it um, I got that picture, and I also got me and Takuma Miyazono, uh, one of the many people who who is in Gran Turismo Seven. Uh, after I completely uh, binned it and threw away our race, uh, I'm still <laughs> I'm still apologetic to uh, Miyazono for that. I hope he forgives me if he remembers us at all. But that's where we stand. I bet he was so well mannered about it as well, though. Like after the fact, he was probably like, "Ah, oh, it doesn't matter." Or was there a bit of a battle between you guys after that? Mm. <laughs> I- I'll never forget that right before we did the race, because we had an interpreter as well, and uh, I was talking to Takuma through the interpreter, and uh, I guess he asked me if I had any questions for him, and I said, "What?" tire do you not want to use and he said the hard one and my response was just okay so i will use the hard one <laughs> that, was that was like that was like all the preparation we did before the race i was just like just tell me what lap i need to pit on the the most soonest available one and tell me what tire i need to use so you can do your work and uh we still didn't do well, but you know, I, I gave him I gave him a, a good hole for us to dig ourselves out of. So, you know, maybe well, maybe that was like one of the inspiring you know moments that that propelled him to his 2020 World Championship victory. We'll never know. It could be exactly every moment's a learning moment. I mean, the, the only question I have about that story is what car did you use? Out of curiosity. God, so I can't remember what car we drove, but it is online. So. I will look it up later, uh, just to remind myself. Also, the the only commentary I remember was um, was Tom. Everyone knows Tom. Everyone loves Tom. Uh, Tom saying that I recovered well from that spin uh, because I spun totally unprompted on my own, and I guess kept going, which is the best thing that you can do if you spin a race car. Yeah, absolutely. I hope you've got that little line on your CV as well. <laughs> Gran Turismo Tom say that I recovered well from that spin. This exemplifies yeah. the types of things that I can work with in the workplace. You know, it's it's a good link. Right, right. My mistakes are teachable moments. I don't let them get me down, and that's that's why I'm here today. Absolutely. Uh, mate. What a tangent but, to start on, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, you know, we're not here to talk about my failures uh, at playing these games. We're we're here to talk about Gran Turismo Seven, of course, and. Um, 
It's very funny because right below where I live, there is an Italian restaurant. And right now they're playing country music very loudly, which is something that happens in Pennsylvania. Um, luckily, the microphone I'm using is so uh, crappy. It's not crappy. It's just like different. It's just like not the best. It's not like the Blue Yeti or whatever. So it doesn't pick up things unless like I'm right up against it. Like you can see where my face is. Uh, at least Brendan yeah. can because uh, we're on a Discord call. But yeah, um, it's a funny thing that that kind of happened when we're recording our most important show. But hopefully it won't it won't uh, appear when we nope. go to publish the podcast. Can't hear a thing, mate, so it's, it's all good <laughs> on my end at least. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, I think first I want to hear what you have to say, which I know is like a very... How do you start talking about Gran Turismo 7, right? Um, yeah. But but you had said before the show, and I think you said on Discord, that like this was going to be a hard one for you to talk about because it's just so many things, encapsulates so many feelings. You seem to be a little bit more embattled about how you feel about the <laughs> game than maybe yeah. I am and maybe other people are. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, c- I can try and sum it up. Like you are saying, talking about any Gran Turismo is a, a challenge. And often when you're talking about the older titles, you, you can kind of look through it for those nostalgia goggles and, and talk more about your experiences with the game and let that guide discussion. But the interesting thing is that GT5 and 6, for example, were very kind of clear-cut in that 5 was a bit of a mess at launch, so it was easy to kind of talk about that directly and the fact that the game didn't quite live up to expectations whilst enjoyable, still very much unfinished, and and 6 felt like what 5 probably should have been if Polyphony had been given a bit more steer, so once again, there isn't really that much to talk about in terms of what those games added to the series outside of a few additions and about five well with the half arsed editions but like you get what I'm saying basically there are a lot of dominating uh, conversation points what's interesting about Gran Turismo 7 I feel like is that it's the first Gran Turismo that's really had me completely blown away in quite some time there's just something about the game when you first boot it up that you genuinely feel it's something special like it's the type of game we just don't get that much anymore um I think like when, when you first put the game up and it kind of puts you in a music rally right away, it, maybe it's just the, the high off of the Tim Hortons coffee at midnight to, to get me through that first <laughs> launch, or, or maybe I, I've just, I don't know, like it's just the vibes off a GT game, but you find yourself like, enjoying whatever music rally is, and believe us, we don't have enough time on a podcast to try and dissect what that's supposed to be. Um, but like it's just that kind of... It's like the prelude to what's about to come like when you first boot the game up, and not many games make you feel like that. Like even even cinematic games that have kind of prologue chapters and stuff before the title roll, they very much feel as if you're already inside the game. But weirdly enough, like with GT Seven, it did feel as if that music rally thing was good in the sense that it kind of prepared me for the, the fucking size of this game and the scale of it. Um, and then obviously it. It's when you watch that intro for the first time and the Gran Turismo intros do a really good job of making you feel like you've accomplished something by getting to the next iteration. So I can only imagine what it's like for the guys actually developing it, but I don't know if anybody else ever feels the same, but it's like when you see that intro for the first time, it's just such a fantastic feeling. You're like, man, it's another Gran Turismo. It's here. Yeah. And, oh man. I mean, I suppose just before I got to my in-depth thoughts on the intro side of things, I mean, what, what were your impressions first? So, as soon as I saw, because I can't remember, you do Music Rally first, right? And then you get yeah. to watch the intro. So, as soon as I realized that the game was forcing me to do Music Rally out of the gate, I just started laughing. I just started, <laughs> like, howling because I, yeah. I just love the idea that they are so into this for some reason that they're going to force it upon anyone or on ev- upon everyone from the word go like that is such a uh, a polyphony thing to just be like this is the experience we want you to have this is how much we believe in it and we believe in it so much we're going to make you do it <laughs> um and it's this incredibly simple thing right it's it's yeah my issue with music rally isn't so much that like i don't think there's a place for a mode like that in the game like gran turismo i think it's that it doesn't do anything unique there's a lot of ways that you could combine music and driving 
they could have maybe had, and this would have probably been difficult, but something that I remember theorizing early on that turned out completely not to be true at all was that like, oh, maybe the song will be like dynamic instrumentally and like the worse you drive or the closer you are to zero, like the instruments will start to like disappear. Kind of like if you've ever played like Luminous or even like Tetris Effect where like the the song will be like composed of things that will enter or fall away depending on the quality of how you're doing. Um, I was like, that could be cool, but that's not how it is. It's literally just like when you run out of beats, the song ends and the game is over. Um, yeah. So I did Music Rally and I was, I was laughing, but... He, there was one moment because I'm driving the Porsche 356 and I think I was able to turn some assists off or maybe just traction control or something. And I kind of started to lose it, like I lose the back end. And I was like, that's weird. That mm. is not something I ever experienced in Gran Turismo Sport, like on a low power car like this. And, you know, little did I know that that was a precursor to to what I think is one of the more uh surprising things about Gran Turismo 7 that we talk about a lot in our discord and there are a lot of different feelings about it but I haven't really yeah. seen it discussed in more mainstream circles and other outlets and it's just that like this game it shows you it presents a very forgiving very introductory very um <laughs> for lack of a better word like kind of coddling presentation for like the new the new car enthusiast the new car lover and then it just fucking hits you with these physics that are like they're tough that for the first time like gran turismo uh whether you're using a controller i would assume a pad i haven't used a pad or sorry i haven't used a wheel but i've heard that wheel play isn't much different but on controller like you sweat like it's it's tough it's tougher than any forza game i've ever played it's tougher than anything really on console um except for maybe some of those weird ports of like you know the old school like uh, i remember there was like that race pro game on the 360 but a lot of the times like with those games or like with project cars it's more just because they never (laughs) they never um tune the handling well for pads like yeah. and that's usually the problem. It's it's not that it's not that the game is too hard, it's that they never bothered to to make it pair well with the controller. But with Polyphony and GT7, you know that they're focusing a lot on the controller and it has all those dual sense features. It's just naturally like hard to play on the pad. And that was kind of I don't want to step over the intro, um, because I know you want to talk more about that, but that was the thing that hit me the most when I started playing. I was like, this is yeah. this is surprisingly challenging. Yeah, I mean that's the thing, like because of the 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 murmurs and the hallways about the, the game being slightly harder kind of trickling out through the preview phase, I kind of didn't have that initial thought of the difficulty because I'd kind of heard it already. I can only imagine being totally blind though, the difference it makes because that this ain't your daddy's Gran Turismo in a lot of ways and I'm somebody who, who's been very vocal about the fact that GT Sport almost feels like kind of point and go in terms of the way that game handles it, the, the very little kind of feedback in terms of the way the tyres react and stuff in my opinion it still handles fantastically but there isn't that kind of bite or kick I'm not sure if PD took that type of stance personally because all the bite and kick is now there and, and it yeah. is evident from Music Rally so it sets a, it sets an intense intro even with those slower cars and just to kind of, kind of cap off the thoughts I was going to say about the intro, I I just feel as if it's the first kind of GT intro that I've watched for a while where the spirit of GT three and four was in there, like the way that it takes you on that kind of journey from the very very early days of motoring right through to, to the modern era, and it almost feels like. It, it's kind of indicative of Gran Turismo as a series on this like, 25th yeah. anniversary where you consider how simplistic the game was before and heralded as being top notch just like the very first motor vehicles would be and then you've got this all singing, all dancing, ray tracing out the ass like fucking incredible clips of racing and in Polyphony ham up big time this is an 8 minute intro or something like that yeah. and there are so many points in the gameplay section you're like oh it's going to end here just keeps going and then it keeps going and 
And you know what? Like, I'm glad they did that because when you watch that GT intro for the first time, like I was saying earlier, it's a special feeling and we'll, we'll only ever get so many of them within our lifetimes. <laughs> that's, that's the way the development cycles of these games go. So, um, yeah, it felt great. It felt like a genuine Gran Turismo title again. Not that 5 and 6 weren't, but I think it's kind of unanimously agreed that, that the PS3 era maybe introduced a dip. Sport was fantastic for a more focused game. But right from the off, you just get the vibe that this is a proper Gran Turismo experience. Yeah, the the whole history of the car they've they've done that before in like different ways. Um, I think something that I think is is kind of funny to reflect on is like when GT Sport came out, came out. I thought it finally marked the end of like self indulgent polyphony, where they were gonna do the seven minute intro where they were going to show you all of the extraneous stuff that didn't really have to do with cars. But um, but no, it's it's alive and well, and, and you could say that GT7 is uh, proof that it is stronger than ever. Um, you know, I think that GT7, and I mean, obviously GT7 is a sequel of the games before it, but GT7 feels like such a... Uh, development such a kinship with five um more so than six in some ways i i think that it's six done better because it tries to go for like a simpler sort of more gamey approach to the campaign but the difference is six did that and had like no soul like no thought to it and sport or seven does it in this way that's much more like you know, let's tell you about the cars. Let's, let's, this is an amazing, like the, the Pokemon post you did with Professor Oak. It's so, <laughs> it's so funny, but it's so true because that's the way that Gran Turismo 7 introduces the world of cars to you. Yeah. And five, I think tried to do that. But the problem with five is that it, it had no idea what the fuck it wanted to be. It was all over the place and it spent too long in development, but also wasn't as finished as it nearly should have been for the amount of time that they spent on it. Um, you know, if, if you are a member of our Discord, you've no doubt seen the posts in the Gran Turismo sub channel about like, here's GT5 like a month before it came out. Half the menus aren't there. And you know, this is, this is the game that they were working with. But GT Sport finally feels like they have captured that idea of like the racing sim the driving sim in the wider context of the world and it's more of a thing to to corral you know up and coming like kids you know new fans uh new motorsport uh people and i i end up like i know that like some will you know discount like the cafe is a gimmick and all that stuff and like the intro is emblematic of that too but i i think that I don't know, it, it speaks to me, because as I'm sure you agree, and any a lot of people who are probably listening to this, like I remember when I was a kid and I played Grand Turismo for the first time, and it's funny thinking about like the experience that I would have now if I was a little kid and GT7 was my first Grand Turismo, versus the one I know I had when I was playing GT1 and GT2. Yeah. Um, it just, you know, it's something that I can't even really put into words, but it's... Uh, it's sort of humbling in a way. It's just it just gives you like a, a warm thought about like you know this series has been around for so long and has meant so many things to so many people, and what they've produced is I think a, a great game. It's instantly one of my favorite Gran Turismo's, but it's also well geared to be an introduction for the next generation of fans. Yeah, absolutely. And the menu system, like you were talking about, Adam, is a a great way to bring people into the, the foray of car culture. At the end of the day, we, we talk about how much Gran Turismo influenced that and how much of it was through kind of natural progression through the game and getting the chance to drive cars and the like, but very rarely did those games ever have a way of actually saying, you know what, here is the story of cars and here's how it goes. And people have different views on how this should go. That You get the elitists, it's like, you should seek out this information if you want to and, and build up from the, the foundations anything provides you. But like, let's not be around the bush here. Like, Kaz has always been very upfront about the fact that Gran Turismo is about the cars. Like that that is the star of the show here. Like that is that is why we're playing the game. Why not have something like the menu system in place? 
Obviously, it being the kind of guiding full focus on the single player was something that maybe wasn't readily apparent before launch, but because they interlace kind of championships in there and some genuinely difficult races, I don't have an issue with me the, the menus being the, the bulk of the game. Um, it really, the, the only kind of concern with the menu system is that in terms of the actual races themselves, they're still heavily dictated by the old Chase the Rabbit stuff, but yeah. that, that's something that Polyphony are obviously set on because they, they have races in here that are actually difficult and they're grid starts and they're exciting and they're great fun. Mm -hmm. um, but for whatever reason, they obviously feel that's the best showcase of let's keep the cars the stars. I'm not sure if it's this... It's almost like a parade, isn't it? Every race is yeah. like a parade of yeah. seeing the vehicles on offer, that sort of thing. Being honest, in other racing games, I'm very rarely paying attention to what's around me because I'm focused on the race, whereas I think Gran Turismo probably goes for this Chase the Rabbit type stuff because you you get that showcase of what the, the game has to offer and you see what cars you're up against because you're in a certain menu. Um, the UI now has that little feature on the side as well where when you pass a car it comes up what car you've just passed. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's almost like... A, evolution in a way of the old um, when you went through a checkpoint that said how far ahead you were of somebody and you got the tiny little thumbnail uh, beside it's, <laughs> the, it's the a thing. little thing it's a little thing but it encapsulates so much of why this game is weird and different like no other game is gonna is gonna do that like no. okay it'll present maybe like a thumbnail of the car and the time but it would never just like it literally just shows up the full name of the car and a huge picture of it takes up like <laughs> a bigger chunk of the ui than you would expect it to and it's yeah it's just so funny to me that they did that they just every opportunity that they can to teach you about what's in the game they take it and it's yeah. it's just funny because no one else really does that yeah exactly and, and that's why like truth be told one of the things i find really frustrating and as i get to the final few menu chapters is this format of race but like like you were saying about that being a teaching tool almost of the cars in the game and, and what car is from who manufacturer wise and that sort of thing i do feel as if for the purposes of guiding the game around this menu system the chase the rabbit system makes more sense it means that you've got a good what, 18 hours of menu content to get through and you will have to get through it ultimately that it's a good core of the game but when I made my peace with that idea that I think Polyphony's in this odd spot where they know they have a fantastic base for competitive racing and they're more than happy to harness it for online play but they still feel as if from a single player game design perspective the Chase the Rabbit element allows them to have a bit more freedom and, and, and I, don't, I don't know, just kind of guide the races towards a higher level of player or lower level of player because the thing about grid starts is the cars are either fast or they aren't and that's the way every kind of game is. Like I was playing Grid Legends just before playing GT7, and that was a game where, or even on Legend difficulty, it felt a bit kind of slow in terms of the opponents around you and stuff. They were hyper aggressive, but once you got past them, they get involved in the wars and you just kind of shot off into the distance, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's just a get it over the line. It feels like Polyphony feel like at least this system means that. It might not be the most exciting racing in the world, um, but it will definitely be one that kind of takes you to the, the last half of the last lap each time, um, which is, it's not exactly dynamic, but it, it still means that you know you've got an objective to go, and in some of these races and tournaments it can get pretty tetchy, especially when there's like PP limits and stuff. I think what, I, I think they want to give you kind of like the space to understand how these cars handle maybe differently get to grips with the car that you have understand more of your of your garage and i'm not necessarily saying that that's the way to go i i think that yeah. maybe there was a way that they could have blended it where they started out with more of the rolling starts and then you know maybe around like the fifth menu chapter or the seventh menu chapter really start easing you into those like <clears throat> more authentic grid starts probably would have been the way to go i don't like the catcher rabbit stuff either i think i you know i think it again it's a way to do it but it doesn't have to be the only way and yeah. for whatever reason polyphony uh believes it is the only way but i think that they also kind of because they're courting that crowd of like you know we we want to really excite people who are new to the world of cars and racing and teach them things um i think they're just really focused on this slow like 
like giving people a place to kind of play around with cars, understand the vehicle dynamics and get yeah. more comfortable with it. Because let's be honest, if you're trying to race aggressively and you're also trying to do that, yes, I know that, you know, many of us played games growing up where it was just hard and it didn't, it didn't, you know, teach you a different way earlier on. So it could kind of coddle you. It just threw you right into the shark tank. But like yeah. these days with modern games, we're able to try different approaches and, you know, that's the approach that they've decided to go with. Um, yeah. I, I just wish, like, I was really happy when I saw those, like, more difficult events marked with the pepper icons and stuff. I thought that that was a cool thing that, like, a nod that they were giving to, um, you know, more advanced players uh, or people who've been playing for a long time. It Those events are there partially because anyone who uh, pre-ordered the collector's edition or, or got the collector's edition or whatever, um, you know, you get the Castrol Tom Supra, you get yeah. that uh, RX GT3, the Mazda, but you have no place to race these cars. So it's trying to kind of give you something to do with that content. And also if you get like all that money that comes with the, the pricier version of the game. Yeah. But I wish that they... I wish that they had more of them, frankly. I, I think that this game just needs more of them. And I, I think they will add to them, definitely, in like a GT Sport style post-release updates. They'll they'll bring in more of those events, which will be really cool. And maybe, you know, we'll, we'll look down the line, and this will be another case, um, as, as has been with so many games, including GT Sport, Drive Club, you name it, where, you know, the spec 2.0 version, a couple patches down the line, this game's going to be better suited to um, fulfill the needs of more advanced players uh, as well as the newcomers. I, I feel like that's probably going to happen. That's usually how these things go anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's it. And at this point, it was funny when I was at the kind of 10, 15 hour playtime mark, I was getting frustrated about the fact that there wasn't these standard races and stuff. But then I take a step back and I realise that ultimately, for me, Gran Turismo has always been a driving game. It's a racing game in terms of what it actually is, but truth be told, I can't really name any instances outside of arcade mode in like GT3, for example, where there's been some genuinely good racing on track <laughs> going on, because there are plenty of games that do that better, but when it comes to the driving experience, especially after 7, everybody's got to step their game up, because the way that Polyphony has made these cars so drivable is that there are so many occasions where you almost feel as if you're just doing the events to try the cars. It's almost like a kind of a live test drive that you're undertaking every time. And, and yeah. listen, that's not going to interest the the new era of sim racers or people who are heavily invested in racing specifically. But like that, that's why I was happy to humble pie on that point by my own accord to realise that sometimes you just got to realise when something isn't something else. And for me, Gran Turismo is not really a standard racing game and, it's, and that's what makes it so special at the end of the day because this is a game who, this is a game, sorry, that through even the new physics uh, improvements that seem to blindside everybody, like Kaz did not talk about this at all pre-release pretty no, much. No, nobody um, did. Yeah. This is a different <laughs> fucking game. <laughs> like, this, is, this is the thing that a lot of people who should not play GT7 yet will be blown away by. Hmm. Like Kaz and PD have created a game that far surpasses what Sport had before it in terms of the driving feel and the games before it. And I say that with both a positive and negative connotation because Polyphony are not afraid, maybe unlike some other developers, in the sense that they will let you know if a car handles that shit. <laughs> they, <laughs> yeah. they, they won't try and sugarcoat it and this is what's interesting about Gran Turismo 7 for me. There are genuinely times when I'm driving cars and it's an absolute misery, like trying to throw this car around a racetrack in the rain or something and it's just like this is uh, awful like, it for me <laughs> for me I, there was like the american muscle car championship oh, they make you drive yeah. like or it, it might have been like the camaro race or something or the chevrolet race but they make you drive like an old camaro or then they make you drive like an old mustang and those are horrible those are absolutely awful like in some other games they're kind of fun because they're heavy they throw their weight around but you're never really in any trouble especially in like gt sport you know some cars were wild but yeah. you could you knew if you were getting yourself into trouble like 
that was too much throttle. And and GT Sport was a really forgiving game at the end of the day. So you know that fair play. But like GT Seven, you know that's one of those cars where I'm like I I just I never want to get behind the wheel of this <laughs> thing. And as soon as I move to the next cafe uh, event, I'm not going to like. Some cars are just generally like bad to drive, and you know maybe that's maybe that's fine. You know, there yeah. there are a lot of games uh, today, maybe every game that wants every car to be, um, if not competitive, then at least like somewhat enjoyable or somewhat intuitive. Uh, maybe more so than it actually was in real life, and I think it almost comes from that same place as like balancing like competitive balancing like in a game like call of duty or battlefield like every gun has to offset the the positives and negatives of every other gun and nothing can be too strong um in gt7 is not that kind of game there are cars that just outright suck and there are cars that are great and you're <laughs> gonna find the ones you like um yeah. and there are people who uh prefer the more um kind of aggressive bitey physics there are a number of them uh in the discord you know who you are uh, and to them I say like great like I'm glad I'm glad that it gives you more to chew on um, you know I think for someone like me it was just it was just such a shock for Gran Turismo to kind of take this dive especially coming out of GT Sport which was the competitive game was completely based around competitive play you would think that they would be trying to weed the pros from everyone else with a more sophisticated realistic uh, less forgiving handling model in GT Sport but what they've actually done is they've they've held that back uh, until GT7 now and now we're all kind of dealing with it so it's one of those things where you know that initial 356 drive uh, the music rally concerned me because I was like how much fun am I actually going to be able to have with this game but uh, you know I, I think if you initially start playing the game and you know maybe some people but you initially start playing the game, you put, you know, five, six, seven hours in, and you'd be surprised how quickly you start to act on physics. You'll never feel maybe 100% confident. Brent, you want to look at that amazing video of you doing the, the Porsche Cup race, and you're going down a long back straight the nerve ring and taking that kind of that, that sweeper right, and you just that's going to happen. I, I think the thing there is, it's not just that GT7 is hard, it's hard in the way that literally no racing sim I've ever played before has been. Which is that, like, and, and for... Look, I'm not a professional driver. I've, I've, I've obviously, I've, you know, been on racetracks and cars going a little bit fast sometimes, but, you know, I, I realize I'm kind of talking out of my ass here, but from what I've understood, or what a history of playing these games has taught me... You know, when you are at speed and you're going through a corner, it doesn't require, like, much lifting or much braking at all, and you can just kind of go along and just dial in, like, not very heavy, not very heavy steering, just light steering, you put the load on those outside tires, everything's planted, that's never where you're going to run to trouble, right? And that's, that's, I think, the prevailing idea. But in GT7, hardest corners are the fastest ones. The fastest ones where you usually don't have to do anything except steer. And like, that's what blows me away. And that's that's something that still, even though I'm kind of coming to grips with the hand right now, I've tried to play for like 30, 40 hours or whatever. It still bothers me. Because there are just a lot of situations where I just take a corner and the first turn of Dragon Trail season I'm just like, there is no universe in which I should have had no grip. No weird grip. Zero. It's it's weird. I, I kind of wonder if, you know, the physics aren't exactly where Polyphony would have preferred that they should be, and if you know, changes the entire model and uh, to, to adjust that. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to fill out the same chat here. He's got a background in, it in terms of like kind of degree and stuff, so he, he goes into intense detail. And he was talking a bit about the physics and 
it's kind of like when you mentioned the tyre model there, Adam, like that, uh, that's good intuition based on what he was saying because basically he feels that the main issue at the moment is that we aren't privy to tyre pressures in this game, for example, so it's like you have the compounds and then we just go with the grip levels basically like we've always done in Gran Turismo racing softs mega grip (laughs) comfort softs trash but the difference is that it seems like the physics now are at least incorporating that level of kind of heat in the tyres and and the way that the tyres are absorbing the tarmac and stuff because that corner that I ate shit on on the Nürburgring there's like at least six or seven people in the replies posting the exact same thing with varying degrees of power with those cars because it must just be with the camber effects, the, the chassis and the way the tyres hit and it just fucks you right off the track. Um, so his idea was basically that it's something to do with tyre pressures potentially and that's something that, that Polyphony will hopefully be able to adjust on their end. But it, yeah, it's interesting, like you're saying, I've never played a game where this is the case before, where basically... When you feel that oversteer, right, you can catch them at lower speeds and there are going to be people that tell us that, oh, well, I've caught it at X speed, whatever. But looking at it, generally speaking, there are more often times than not when you feel that back again going and you're reacting to the haptics and you kind of counter steer it. But then the car just goes in the other direction as well. Right. And you're like, it just, OK, the- I'll go to the next one. And it just, you know, you're going, but you can't stop it. <laughs> The tank slappers are endless in this game. And, uh, you know, the race cars are pretty easy to drive, uh, and the road cars are, are pretty uh, uh, pretty much a handful uh, a lot of the time. I mean, you know, front-wheel drive cars are generally very easy and just a lot of fun because you don't have to worry about with those, and the same kind of goes for the, the four-wheel drive cars as well. But anything that's rear-wheel drive, especially anything that's mid-engine and rear-wheel drive and a road car, yeah, uh, you're, you're looking at trouble. I mean... I feel like I have a sort of an idea of the way that the car should drive. Just having played games, like, games that are more realistic than this, that are agreed upon as being more realistic, right? Like iRacing or Assetto Corsa. It's like, I don't think I would have lost it there. I don't think I would have had zero grip in that corner in yeah. iRacing, for example, right? Um, then again, you know, in iRacing, you're driving race cars. So there, there are a lot of variables here, but, um, yeah, it's... And we could talk about it forever. Um, yeah, but it's yeah. uh, it's it's just it's just shocking, and it's not you know it's not one of those things I think necessarily like makes the game good or bad. Like I said, I think I'm at a point now where I'm starting to get to grips with it, and I wish certain things were changed. But um, if anything, it makes the game more interesting to talk about. Um, I think there are there are genuine criticisms that that I have, um, but I kind of want to hear more from your side, Brendan, because I feel yeah. I feel like you've got. I feel like you've got actually like, you know, a couple bones to pick with this one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, on the criticism front, the first foremost point block were those physics we discussed. I, I get what Polyphony are going for in terms of giving each car such individual characteristics, but I feel as if for a game that has previously used the tagline racing is for everyone in the <laughs> last game coming into this racing is for fucking no one if you're driving a full <laughs> gt in the rain at the red bull ring oh god the rain that. oh my god the <laughs> it rain into this that game. as well I, oh. um <laughs> but like this is the thing that kind of frustrates me because for a company with such attention to detail i've had numerous people give me good advice on oh if you use traction control two or one or whatever that car it feels great if that's the way that car is supposed to be driven there needs to be information in the game that says as much. Like, I get mm. why, if I'm driving a Group 4 car on zero traction control and, and no driving aids, it'll carry over into the next car I drive. It feels as if a Polyphony are going to go down this hyper, like, character-driven vehicle route, they really need to show what actually illustrates that car's behaviour. Because if the Ford GT drove the way it did, as it did for being that race, then every one of the owners would be dead. It, it's <laughs> just like, you just can't fucking drive it in the way that I, I play. And that, that's why I'm saying up front, I, I don't use driving assist aside from S Licence 10, because that's just fucking crazy. Yeah. Um, but you I, know, I, 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 I will jump in real quick and say Andy, Andy Hamilton uh, had a really good theory that uh, he expressed to me because we were, we were kind of texting each other because I he was the only person I knew that was playing the game before release and I was like I need to talk to somebody about this because yeah. these physics are going to fucking blow people away and he had a really interesting theory which is that because GT7 allows you to do I mean you could tune car you couldn't upgrade cars in sport but you could tune them 
But GT7, with the whole the new performance point calculation and what they've done to that tuning menu, they really want people to, to tinker with cars in GT7. Yeah. And, and the theory that he said to me was that the game is harder to handle to encourage players to do that. And, I mean, that, that may well be the case, but if that is the case, my problem with that is this game wastes no breath telling you about the history of the Skyline GTR yeah. and how it was dominant in Japanese Grand Touring Car Racing, but it never explains to a new player what toe is, what camber is, what is the benefit of like a, a soft uh, soft springs in the front versus the rear. You know, it doesn't explain those things. Those are things that, you know, if, if this, again, if this is the audience you're catering to, you got to explain that shit. I mean, yeah. hell, I don't know how the really, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of dabbled with tuning cars in this and Forza over the years, but I'm not even really somebody who really likes to build a car and make it handle great. I, frankly, I haven't really had to because it was never an issue in any Gran Turismo before this one. Yeah. Um, so you, you really need to kind of, I think those are things you need to take the player by the hand and explain. That, that would definitely go a long way to kind of filling that knowledge gap. Yeah, exactly. And well, we're on that subject as well. If you're going to go down that route of encouraging tuning in the likes, have a way of sharing tuning settings too. Like, yeah. g- give the give the user, the, the player, sorry, the chance to use different setups to, to test the car and see what difference it makes as well. Like you said, the menu system pretty much exists for this type of knowledge to be shared. And although there, there are menu items like, oh, upgrade your car, it's just basically telling you to shove a fucking high RPM turbocharger on it and yeah. for the best. <laughs> like it, it's not it's not actually teaching you why that might be a bad idea in your EK Civic, do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, yeah. It, ultimately, this is that's the issue, so I feel as if there, there's a disparity between the new level of physics and what the games and the series' overall message is. I now feel right. as if there's a little bit of a divide there, and that's my main criticism, really. Okay for guys like us, we've got a fucking racing game podcast. We talk about game racing games all the time. But the the, the fact of the matter is that you can't just be relying on the fact that, oh, well, new players will be using loads of assists anyway and numbing the feeling of the car. Eventually, they're going to want to take the training wheels off and wonder why this 200 grand supercar is absolute trash. Like They're, mm. they're going to want to understand why that might be the case and feel as if that's where the game drops the ball in a crucial way. Like, I feel as if the... The theme of Gran Turismo is at odds with this new, incredibly detailed approach to the physics that I enjoy, but know that there are so many cars that I'll never drive because I'm terrible at tuning and um, I, I just I, I cannot vibe with them at all. And like like I was saying at the start, that's fine. Not every car drives well, um, but I feel as if when you're trying to encourage this idea that you must drive these Camaros and stuff, like. You've really got to give the player a little bit more options in terms of understanding why that thing handles so different to the other cars. Um, and maybe you could skip the history lessons a little bit on uh, in some of the, the kind of the menu items and focus on more kind of driving centric information. So that, yeah. that's the main kind of criticism I have. The other stuff I'll run through kind of quite briefly since the art is major. I really feel as if that theme disparity has been what's kind of up to me a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, Second of all, at listen, new game in 2022, post-pandemic, we get an incredibly difficult scenario to develop games in, but the online just now just seems as if it, I don't, <laughs> it, it's, you look at sport being the well-oiled, streamlined racing, do, like, it was perfect, dominus, the dominus of fucking racing like, game it, online, yeah. I, I don't want to hear anybody else say any other games, the fact is GT Sport so accessible, they, they had it down to a T, the, the online lobby system was obviously very PD, but also very much worked the way it should. Yeah. Um, you take sport over in almost an identical format, but right off the bat, you just kind of ruin it by including tuning right off the bat, and obviously this is all subjective. For me personally, I feel as if a spec series should always have spec cars. You can have tuned events as well. But you launch the game with only tuned events once again, maybe going back to that point you were saying Andy was making about getting people to tweak cars and such. But then it's not even that, it's the fucking lobby systems in this game, man. Like you you've got <laughs> multiplayer where you can't change the, the track after you've made a lobby. You've got these weird like 
rec rooms in each location in the game. Which I never well. see. I don't know if it's like a, a if it's just some kind of glitch on you know Polyphony's part or the server or whatever. But I never see anyone in those rooms, which I know is impossible. There yeah. have to be people in those rooms, but every single room it says zero out of sixteen, zero out of sixteen for the uh, the meeting places. I guess is what they're yeah. called. Yeah, I, I found two people in the Trial Mountain one on release, but that's like the only time I've ever seen anybody <laughs> in it. Um, th there's just there's a, there's a weird disparity here. Uh, the, the UI and UX experience is fantastically Gran Turismo, which means there's going to be some kinks in there. Mm -hmm. But the way that the online stuff is, is all over the shop, like the way you've got these lobbies, each individual track map location, but you've got only only some as well. That's Wait, the what? other funny really? thing I noticed. Not every track is a meeting place, and I don't understand the rationale for the ones that get it and the ones that don't. Like, Trial Mountain does, and like, the Nurburgring <laughs> does, but like, Interlagos doesn't. I don't get it. I didn't notice that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you look, if you look at the world map, and the, the reason that I noticed this was because having played the game before, there was an update that went live, like, on March 2nd or March 3rd. And I got the game like a week before that. So, yeah. you know, I played a version of the game that is a little bit different than the one that came out. There aren't any massive differences, but there were a couple UI tweaks. And one of them is that the world map now, the game that everyone's played, it gives you like a little icon of like yeah. people like yeah. next to the track name. That wasn't there in the 1.0 release or whatever it was called. So... Yeah, that's something I noticed and I just thought was very strange and didn't really get that. It's even more strange now. So yeah. <laughs> to, to top that whole point <laughs> off, the, the very haphazard implementation of online, um, I would have ditched the pair track lounges and just made everybody's profile have a lounge like the way you did in GT5. Like, yeah, if, if, you, if, yeah. if you really wanted to have that option, that's what I would have went for, but... I mean, if you can't change tracks anyway, <laughs> once you're in a lobby, then um, mm. maybe it's not that big a deal. They will fix that, of course, and it may, might even be right. fixed by the time this podcast goes live. But... I mean, I'm just shocked it's not fixed yet. Like, yeah. I, I saw that no, uh, the known issues blog uh, that was like posted the day the game went out or the day before the game went live, and I was like, oh, that's... You know, I didn't even really try to play with anyone online because I think there might have been some sessions the PR people were playing on, but I was just too busy, so I was just going through the, the single-player experience. Yeah. Um, but I was like, oh, well, they'll have that fix in, in a couple of days. And yeah, it's been, like, almost a week now, and I feel like it's kind of too long for a new game to have, like, lobbies are semi-broken. Like, they technically work, yeah. but no one would want to use them. We're, we're not even doing GT Thursdays right now because we'd have to keep remaking the lobby over and over again and nobody <laughs> wants to do that so yeah yeah, yeah. exactly so the, the online uh, the online implementation at launch is pretty unforgivable all things considered that that's one of the other bugbears i have um i also feel as if and it's a point for another time potentially but you could have really expanded on the idea of sport mode with some sort of kind of overarching but semi campaign structure and stuff in there to encourage people to use it menus could have introduced sport mode and, and gave everybody that level of training you got in sport just seems a bit of a disappointment to get rid of that it's shocking that they don't explain what sport mode is <laughs> pretty much unless you click on it like yeah. i don't know it was such a focal point of gt sport obviously and it was it was an idea that so many people were skeptical of that like i count myself among those who were completely won over by it um just like oh this is actually like me someone who hates competitive play hates pressure uh actually was like into doing the sport mode races in like 2018 and and, and yeah. around that Same. time and uh yeah, they've not only done a questionable thing by allowing tuning and having those like free form road car races where you just have to fit under under like a certain PP limit, but they've yeah. also just like not really explained it or shared. Like you would think for all of the FIA Gran Turismo competitors whose identities and likenesses are in the game, yeah. before every cafe race they're talking to you and telling you what car they're driving, which is very cool and very cute. Yeah. You'd think that one of them would say, like, I got here by doing sport mode. 
<laughs> and they never do. Yeah, that's they never true, do. Actually. Like you <laughs> they know, just refer to themselves as like world champions or whatever. Right, but, right. You don't uh, know why. You know, uh, Mikhail Hazal never says like the only reason I'm in this game is because I went over to the sport icon and I won a lot, <laughs> and then I you know went yeah. to went all over the world doing it. Yeah. So it's just it's funny how like they they it's. These are things that, like, these are dots that could so easily be connected that they just didn't. And, yeah. I mean, in a game like Gran Turismo that's as big as GT7 is, I know some things are going to fall by the wayside, but it's just funny to think about. Yeah, it's a very strange one to fall away, especially when, when you boot the game up, you've got World Map, Music Rally. Like, <laughs> why, why don't you have an option right there for, like, the fucking regulated sport races like that you'll have? Mm. Like, And once again, it's something they can add, but you're just like... I, I don't understand this. Like, sport was heralded as this massive step forward for console racing, and it's been reduced to a tiny blip on a map that a lot of people won't ever touch because the menus yeah. never dabble on it. The Rupert never talks about it. Like, it's. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, for me, that, that's the kind of the, the other main criticism, mm -hmm. really. I feel as if the game has the menu system and it uses it in a great way in terms of te teaching people the history of cars and such. But it, in general, the, the third last criticism is that there's still that weird lack of direction throughout. I feel like the menu system does a great job of, of making the cars the star, as you would expect. But in terms of introducing the, the elements of Gran Turismo that make it so special, it's just a little bit too free format times even still. And listen, this is a monumentally sized game. That, like you are saying, Adam, there are going to be points missed. But some of the things are just like, this is very strange why they've just pushed that to the side and not even referenced it. They've they've unlocked it on the map and not even really elaborated on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, I mean, I agree with both of those things. I think there are just some really weird polyphony-esque decisions that kind of... You know, it's funny because, again, like, thinking back to sport i thought that they had like sort of worked their w worked their way through a lot of this shit but in reality sport was just such a streamlined game that didn't really give them the opportunity to fuck up on some of these old game design things but <laughs> yeah. they're still you know fucking up on them so like um yeah just like the used car dealership i wish that it gave you more cars and i also wish it just switched things out more often um the the same goes for the legend car dealership i mean you get five yeah. cars and it's very slow and now that I've just completed the cafe, actually, as of a couple hours before recording this, there's something interesting that happens where when you go back to the used car dealership for the first time since, you, uh, since you've since you completed the cafe, uh, Andy, I think is the guy's name, shows up and he says that now these will switch daily. And I guess they weren't before because they were trying to give you cars that you would need for the cafe events or something, but... Mm there's something that happens once you finish that campaign and it affects the ways that cars are kind of floated in. There are a lot of cars in this game. They're, the models are beautiful. The rendering is unbelievable. Yeah. It's the accuracy is second to none. I, you will not find the bigger advocate for gamification of, of something like this for, for just like a, a gamey ass fucking racing game. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I don't like, getting everything off the bat i don't like being able to just walk up and do everything i like secrets um and gt7 has a lot of secrets but i think it almost goes a little bit too hard because like you need invitations to buy certain like really exclusive cars in brand central and that's a thing that uh, I don't know. I just hope they kind of reconsider down the line because I don't really mind right now that I can't buy a Carrera GT because, you know, there are so many cars in this game I want to drive and we'll get to a Carrera GT when we get to it. But like if months from now, for whatever reason, I don't get that invitation, I don't know how soon these, how, how often these are going to go out, but, um, I'm going to be really fucking pissed off because like that's like one of the last things in the game that maybe I want to do or one of the one of the cars that I want to see that I haven't gotten to see yet. So I I just wish that they either gave you if they were going to insist on this very restricted idea with a lot of this content, I wish they either like switch things more quickly or yeah. gave you a bigger selection. Either would be okay. And I like that there's a used car dealership. And I, I, I even thought it was so crazy that like 
the the auction you know the legendary auction dealership is a haggerty thing i thought that yeah, was fucking yeah. insane like i mean as someone who works in like automotive journalism like haggerty is an institution uh have you seen the I dynamic think, price and stuff as well really, i haven't dealership? yeah i mean i see the arrows go up and down by i actually haven't like notice them change i really don't know what the arrows are reflecting so basically um, the pricing is dynamic based on hegarty's own index for how much cars are in demand and how much they're going for in real life and the prices will adjust in the game okay yeah i think <laughs> i think i recall reading something on that yeah. but um but yeah like i think that's really cool uh, it, it's also another case of like Gran Turismo kind of melding with real life. Um, I think Haggerty just like bought Radwood or something as of today. I read that. So like just, yeah, it, it's just stuff like that. I love, but, um, and I think the, uh, the, the sort of culture around it and the, the, the little things that they do, like with the cafe, for example, I think it's so cool that like automotive designers just show up in the cafe. <laughs> yeah. That me as like a car nerd, as someone who grew up like wanting to be a car designer for a good chunk of my childhood, I, it made me so happy when I like showed up with, it was a Sylvia, which is a weird thing, but I showed up with a Sylvia and Ed Welburn, who is like GM design royalty, like led the design team and everything for decades, like shows up. And just starts talking to me about the Sylvia, which is like not even a car I think he worked on because he was at GM. <laughs> and um, I just thought that was so cool. I thought that was so cool. I know it's probably not really him. I know he really didn't say those things. But like <laughs> as, as a nerd, it's awesome. Yeah. But you can see that they spent a lot of time on that and they maybe didn't really think through some of the more logistical aspects of the experience. And, and that maybe could have used a little bit more fine tuning. Yeah, I think the the idea of the used car dealership is something I've always loved. Um, GT Seven's implementation of having a used car dealership, invitations, and the legendary cars cycling it, that feels a bit too disparate to me. In the sense that that's three different random rules or perceived <laughs> random rules that you've got to take tabs on. And if you decide to buy that Alpha and Legend Cars and that Carrera GT invitation pops up, you're going to be fucking raging if you've spent all your, your, uh, your credits. Or worse yet, and, if you've been yeah. waiting for like an invitation or you buy a Legend car and then you get like a prize roulette <laughs> and you get that car, I would be fucking screaming. <laughs> because the other thing no one talks about in this game, um, and I can blame myself for this too because I'll mention it in the review, but you can't sell cars. No. You can't, and that... A lot of games are doing that now. Forza, her, Forza's been doing that. Um, well, I guess with Forza you can, but you can if you want it. So maybe Gran Turismo is worse in that regard. But regardless, like, <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of hate that because I know the point of this game is to collect cars, but I've never been a car collecting type of person. I, I, I like to collect the cars I care about, and I have absolutely zero interest in collecting cards that I don't like. Yeah. And... Gran Turismo 7 is a lot of cars I like, but it has way more cars I don't, so... Yeah, and if it's about collecting cars, then I still don't see the issue in getting a car and selling it and it still being in your encyclopedia. Like, if yeah. you want to draw comparisons to Pokemon, like, you can get a shitty Pokemon you don't want and get and get it to fuck when you're done with it and it's still in your Pokedex. <laughs> yeah. Like, you yeah. still have that option. Um, I'm the same as you in a sense, like, thank you for all these cars menu modes probably never going to drive like 30 percent of them ever again and they're just going to take up my garage um mm. yeah the lack of selling cars is weird and naturally in 2022 the the easy route to go down which a, a few outlets and stuff did is that they're trying to control the economy for the, the credits and all that sort of stuff i genuinely just think like it's just a weird trend now where for some reason racing games don't think like selling your car for parts for your favorite cars is not a fun loop it really it really is like ultimately yeah i'd rather have one like crazy toyota aqua s than <laughs> the aqua s the Mio and, and whatever else like at the end of the day <laughs> I, I, I want to have the cars i want to drive um and that that shouldn't mean that i can't enjoy the collector side of it it should just mean that i control what's in my garage for my benefit instead of just getting rid of cars for no reason yeah yeah it'd be nice um 
there's not even really much of an economy that needs to be controlled in this game. I mean, you you have to uh, you have to do races, um, and when the money you get is never like. It's enough to buy parts for maybe whatever car you want, but the cars are very expensive in this game, so you won't have any issue upgrading a car, but you will have an issue buying a car. <laughs> yeah. um, and yeah. it seems like it's pretty firm in that way, so like, I guess they want to prevent people from buying cars. I, I don't, yeah, I don't really know. I don't, yeah. I don't really get it. Once again, flies in the face of sport mode. I said this in <laughs> the Discord as well, but it's like, when the Group 4 tournament rolls around, like, you only have a few cars to choose between. Now that the roulette wheels and the daily marathon can include credits and parts for your car, which obviously leads on to another secret in the, the way of engine swaps. Um, it, like you're saying, like it feels like you'll get cars from menu events and stuff because the game mandates you get them. But man, those r- roulette wheels... I always end up getting fucking fired. They're brutal. And stuff from them. I get <laughs> terrible, terrible <laughs> shit. I got you get a six star one for doing the um, the final event in the cafe, and I got like a the, the rewards in there weren't great. There was like it looked like there was a racing camshaft. There was lots <laughs> of money. Uh, yeah. One of them was a McLaren VGT, which I got, which I guess is supposed to be a big deal, but to me, honestly, isn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of, it's kind of a waste. So the the yeah. if you were pissed off at getting you know uh, 2015 Mustang for the seven thousandth time in GT Sport, it's not that much better in this game. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's odd. Um, it definitely feels like they've got that part down part about any cars you buy definitely feel like yours because it's costing you an arm and a leg to get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in terms of the flexibility to buy those cars you want and the, the means of, of getting them, a lot more limited perhaps than previous games. Um, you're definitely not going to find any Gran Turismo 4 style easy money cheats in this game. Believe me about that. Um, Somebody was saying days, actually one of the dirt events, okay. uh, it's like dirt champion sh- event or something, you get like 100,000 credits if you get, I'm guessing like a clean race bonus or something. But those those dirt events are wild though. Like you, <laughs> the It's funny because yeah. in terms of handling, they actually feel, in my opinion, better than they've ever felt in the Gran Turismo game before. Yeah. But the gravity is fucked up. Like you, you hit, you take a lot of bad hops in this game and it just shoots you to the moon it's really weird yeah you see it on uh, to a lesser extent on the curbs as well like sort of the triangle curbs and stuff you can get a, a rough idea of it but if you go somewhere like fisherman's ranch um i think it's s license six when it's the gr yaris mm. on that track or some that sardinga I can't, I can't remember um but mm. one of those tracks and it's like at the very last like straight away there's a huge jump and like it, it can just fuck you up and you haven't done anything wrong it's just that the, yeah. <laughs> it's decided that you've done it bad and you can slow down to take it easier but it's a license test like you want to try and maintain your speed as much also, as possible also <laughs> when you're racing against a computer it's not like they slow down to take it easier so yeah. the, the bumps just don't affect them uh, which is I guess kind of just to mention one thing that bothered me about this game the AI if you're on the expert difficulty the AI is fast yeah. And the AI races you harder than I think in any other Gran Turismo game I've ever played. Like they, they are so resistant to giving you any room, and they are so resistant to to moving to to you know sort of even just like even if you just pass them, like they have zero awareness. So they will hit you. <laughs> they will spin you coming out of corners. You have to be really careful to kind of look over your shoulder, look in your mirrors after you pass someone because chances are they're in the the exact same position that they would have been if you weren't there at all. Um, And the thing is that, you know, you get punished, obviously, if they hit you, if they take you out, you you, you will be, you will spin, um, you will lose a lot of speed, but they can never be punished for driving like idiots. Like if you... Uh, believe me, I've tried to torpedo some of them out of complete frustration. I've tried to just like pump them into into the sun, and like they don't budge. You, they don't budge. They they are they are immovable objects, and that's something that feels you know old school uh, racing game, but not not in the best way. 
it's pretty funny that because I always felt as if Gran Turismo was one of the few games where you could absolutely punt somebody off like <laughs> to the moon pretty much if you T-boned them or something but in this game it's like they just it's as if they immediately hit the brakes and like the, the fucking centre of gravity just pulls right down and they yeah, yeah. they don't want to budge and one of the the, um, the main issues with that is in the mission modes where don't touch any other cars when, when you're trying to do these missions and you pull off an overtake at scuba or something like that and the car behind you just plows into the back of you and that's it mission failed like you've <laughs> overtaken them but why would they slow down they, they're not right. trying to meet that criteria so um, a lot of these uh, missions are especially interesting. There's a few people been talking about one of them being impossible. I don't know if that just means like highly improbable or it's genuinely like, an <laughs> issue where the cars just plow into you or whatever. But that that is something that the AI drivers are um, a bit interesting to say the least. Um, yeah. I am a huge fan though of the AI drivers uh, being those guys from like, the GT World Series and stuff. That is um, very cool. Yeah, that's I'm, very I'm a cool. big advocate for how Gran Turismo creates its own racing universe, like through the Group Fours, mm-hmm. Group Threes, and stuff. And this just further enforces that. Like there are real race car drivers. We've seen the way that Jeff Gordon was represented in GT5, <laughs> but like GT7 continues that kind of. It's almost like lore of like these are the legends of this like universe. These guys made their career playing some mode. Who knows what it is? Of course, <laughs> we're never fully introduced to it. But they they made their way somehow in Gran Turismo um, as being great drivers and such. And I love the idea that those are the guys you're aiming against. I think that's really cool. Boomers are probably going to be annoyed it isn't Senna and right, right. Schumacher and stuff you're racing. But I love it, man. Like it's so funny. Like. I see Valo, for example, uh, Gallo, sorry, um, overtaking me on a straightaway, and then like I look at my phone and he's liked that video of me absolutely eating dirt on Nurburgring, like he's liked that video <laughs> and stuff, like it's so funny, he's like, I can't escape this guy, he's, he's just yeah, making my life He's hell. everywhere. I love <laughs> how, so how often they talk about things that have nothing to do with racing, like, you know, <laughs> Nicholas Rublar show up will be like, you should visit Chile sometime, it's a great place, the people are so friendly, it's like... <laughs> I love Gran Turismo. I just, yeah. I love this. It makes no sense, but. And you just know, like, polyphony, just like, you know what? Those are great answers. Fire them straight in. Like, there's an, <laughs> there's another guy. It's like, who am I dating? Gran Turismo, of course. <laughs> I can't didn't see that. Oh, that's amazing. That. <laughs> amazing. And, uh, and then, of course, the, the condescending, have you watched the video demonstration? Uh, <laughs> messages and I... licenses. I love that the the I, I I hate bromance, but I really don't know what else to call it. Bromance is I'm sure too strong a word, but the camaraderie, if you will, between Mikhail Hazal and Takuma Miyazono, because I think they both drove for Subaru in the championships, and in the game in GT7, they both drive Subarus in races where they're competing <laughs> against each other in some of the championships, and they'll usually mention each other. Like, <laughs> oh, we drove for Subaru. I have to, you know, drive my WRX Group 3 better than Mikhail because, you know, we, we're both such big Subaru fans, but I want to be the better Subaru driver. Like, it stuff like that's great. I just, yeah. you know. I, I love and it. That, that's the type of thing that, like, it's only going to matter to a very select group of people, but it makes a big difference to those people. Ultimately, this is the platform to le- learn about these guys, though. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you yeah, know what? yeah, yeah. Kaz PD, get them a-, a section in Brand Central. Do you know what I mean? Have these drivers yeah. with their own profiles and stuff. Like, you've got Lewis Hamilton in there. Like, <laughs> those little bits of information will be great, just in terms of sharing who these mm. guys are and what they've achieved. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, that the esports side of Gran Turismo is very much. It's not driven by money or anything. It's driven by people who love racing and Gran Turismo and the, the kind of the prestige of the event. And have, being like embedded in this game must be so fucking great for those guys. Like they, they were in the GT Sport intro, of course, that was added later down the line, and that was brilliant as well. But it, it must just be such a surreal feeling seeing that those little profile photos and the little bits of t- like the tidbits of information you get that kind of semblance of their personality and. That that is very much a, a polyphony thing for the, the 21st century in many ways, in the sense that it's it's taking those type of gimmicks that they are so good at implementing and just making it so charming. Like it, it's just it's fantastic, and 
listen, we've spent a lot of time talking about parts we're critical of about this game and stuff, but I think between us we've got like 70 hours seat time or something like that. Yeah. It's, this is yeah. a belter of a game. Like, there are uh, a lot of minor issues and quirks and stuff, but man, it, it's good. I love this game. I mean, I really do. I'm really, really happy with it. There there was a moment where I started, like I said, where I was a little bit unsure because I was wondering how much I was actually going to enjoy the driving, which, you know, was a big part of GT Sport for me. But yeah. I've put enough time in to know, you know, this for me ranks... Uh, I'm really going to have to reassess my, like, Gran Turismo ranking. And, you know, it's yeah. one of those things where, like, I'm pretty much accepting of the fact that, like... It's really, it's going to be really hard for anything to ever touch like two and four for me because those are like deep in nostalgia as like my favorite games when I was a kid. But like, definitely, I mean, for me, no question the best one since four. It's not even close. Yeah, uh, it's not even close. And then I was something obviously who I've, I've said a lot, like, really could not stand five and thought six was like slightly better, but still not great. Yeah. So it's nice. It's nice to. I think we always have this expectation. I have it a lot with music where a band I really like that has come out with so much amazing work comes out with a new album. And I'm like, but it's never going to be <laughs> like, you know, it's never going to be like one of their classics, but then something like GT seven happens and it's like, wow, there's, there's something else to add to the, add to the mantle there. So I'm very happy with it. And I think it's going to be a great place once they, once they finally get those lobby issues figured out, it's going to be yeah. a great place for us to have some, GT Thursday type uh, tomfoolery. <laughs> I think it says a lot. Like, the foundations for which GT7 has to build on is better than anything we've had since 4. So mm. you put that in the context and you're talking about this game in 2-3 years time. What's it even going to look like? This, this is the thing like Polyphony have always supported their games heavily in the kind of online era and now they have more tools than ever to facilitate that. We're seeing it through the dynamic pricing and the legend car dealership little elements like that um the integrated kind of blog system and stuff for learning about uh, what's going on in the game in terms of what to expect in the future that sort of thing this is a game that in two or three years time will probably far surpass anything in the genre i'm happy enough to, to, to throw that out there it's a pretty big statement but ultimately for me what polyphony have managed to create has went far beyond my expectations in many ways like i've always been pretty vocal about the fact that uh, for it's Sport Point Five, you know that way, like we'll get that kind of more full-fledged GT League type stuff in there, but we know what to expect. And yeah. in many ways, I commend PD for like pulling the rug out from under me so fucking brutally with the physics <laughs> changes and stuff because it's like it made an ass out of me because like, yeah. that wasn't what I was expecting ultimately. And there right. are loads of things like that I don't expect. The amount of detail in here for a game that I think many people probably agreed was going to be a nice evolution on what or iteration evolution whatever on sport it's something that really stands on its own kind of two feet and mm. we haven't talked about the visuals or graphics that much because the fact is that if you've been online in the past for four days or so <laughs> you've seen that this is one of the best games like in terms of visuals in terms of like the replay visuals and escapes and stuff it's an absolute master class in fidelity like it's just unbelievable mm. The audio too, um, yeah. you know, add me sir, who's like a really big uh, audio nut uh, when it comes to car sounds and stuff in the Discord, is just like regularly talking about how surprised he is that you know, Gran Turismo stepped up in the audio game, and it's a, I mean, I don't have the ear for it, but there are times where I'm like, yeah, that yeah. sounds really good. Um, Again, you know, the, the soundtrack's not for me. I'm not going to drag this podcast down with that. But <laughs> but in terms of the car audio, yeah. you know, uh, high marks all around. Yeah, I mean, just since you touched on the soundtrack, we won't go delve into it because I don't want the pitchforks coming out. You stretch but, um, this for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm very surprised at the lack of new music in this game, I will yeah. say. Um, I get it's the 25th anniversary title. Um, I'm willing to bet I could probably say low 20% for people who associate Gran Turismo with Daiki Kasho and Daiki Kasho alone as far as those older If you like Daiki Kasho, like this game is your paradise. If you like <laughs> yeah, if yeah. you like everything he's done basically since GT4 and not really before it, it's great. Yeah. But that's that's my that's like to put it in a nutshell. I 
The funny thing is, I feel like I express this opinion. People are like, oh, you hate like Grand, you don't like Grand Turismo music. You don't like the jazz. I love that stuff. GT3 and yeah, GT4, yeah, yeah. incredible soundtracks. GT2 is great. Um, but I feel like this game re repurposes a lot of music, but it repurposes the wrong music. Like, yeah. there's all the Masahiro Ando songs from GT1, which are represented really well here. There's a lot of GT5, 6, GT5 and 6 uh, Daiki Kasho stuff and some of the other songs from those games. But there's nothing from GT3 or 4 <laughs> or 2. There's no From East to West. There's no Light Velocity. There's no Mr. Four Wheel Drive. Wind Road that was in GT2 and GT Sport is not in this game. Like, there is a whole chunk of Gran Turismo musical history that isn't here. And yeah. unfortunately, it happens to be my favorite chunk. So for that, <laughs> you know, I can't really, I can't really give it the pass. Yeah, and, and this is the thing, Adam, once again, don't want to get pitchforks out for you, but I know you're not a massive <laughs> fan or understander of the hype as far as feeder goes as well, but yes, I mean, sorry. it's not going to cost that much to license those guys, surely. I'm pretty sure it's Sony, <laughs> BMG, or whatever they're what called. What is feeder the, doing today? Or say, yeah, are they still around? What? They still make albums. Yeah, they still make <laughs> albums every so often, but the point is, like, it couldn't have been that difficult to put these tracks in there, make a music rally stage for it. Maybe they're keeping it for the Seattle Circuit DLC and they'll add that in with the yeah. the, the fucking the, the Dodge Viper. But um, it, on the soundtrack, no. man, like I wonder, I just want to know: is there a specific song that you truly detest in this game? Like whenever it comes on, you're just like, oh god. This so is the there worst are a thing. lot of. Here's the thing: there are some Daiki Kasha songs I actually like, like Soul on Display is kind of overplayed at this point but when that song came out in the gt5 trailer i loved it and there are a yeah. couple songs here and there from gt6 like looking for you and survive that i kind of like but a lot of his stuff i hate like a lot of his, <laughs> like uh a lot of his stuff like his his i sometimes i think maybe it's a, the uh, vocalist he partners with are just not good yeah. but a lot of his a lot of his rock songs i don't like now his work in the GT3 era was amazing because he, to me, like he was just making straight like electronic industrial industrial bangers, and like that's what I'm here for. Like I fucking love Mirage, I love Skyscraper. Those are amazing songs, but um, the one about uh, oh god, that's the other thing. They're all the lyrics. It's all like anime FMV bullshit. <laughs> it's like. You know, changing your life. Today is a new day. All that. Like, I just, I don't, I don't care. I just don't care. So, anyway, it's a lot of Daiki Kasha <laughs> stuff. Also, yeah. uh, entertainer. Uh, why, why we bring back the entertainer? It's, why <laughs> yeah. I, I disagree with you there, mate. Like, the entertainer is here to stay. I'm happy with that. Um, I loved, just... I loved GT Sport soundtrack. And I've realized now everyone hates GT Sports soundtrack because it's like too weird and spacey. But I yeah. like that stuff. That's what I want to hear. Like, yeah, that's fair. Uh. <laughs> on the subject of the soundtrack anyway. songs that I detest, man, there's one called Dr. Awesome. And yes, oh yeah, that God, one's man. really bad. That one's like, um, <laughs> so uh, shit. Oh, where are the lyrics to that one? It's uh, it's like people are having good times or something like that. Is like the chorus. It's really bad. <laughs> Mate, it's one of those ones that come on and I actually cringe, man. Like it's, it's so, so bad. fucking bad. I can put up with like some of the more kind of crin like cringy anime lyric type stuff, but that song is just one of those ones. I'm like, how is this even made? Like it's so so bad. It's hard to yeah. words. I'm playing it in my headphones now. Oh my god. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's very surface level. Like, this is a rock song. This is an upbeat rock song. And yeah. yeah well, somebody really in the YouTube comments has tried to, to get the lyrics done, right? So it's like, just singing the song with the wind breeze in your face now, with a smile, your eyes and sunshades, going down to the beach, don't know if you're invited. Just for a while, but the barbecue is out. Make sure they know who's the picture. Like, it's just... Oh, my days. It's one of those songs that come on for me in the Porsche Cup Nürburgring race. And maybe that's why I crashed, because I was just getting more <laughs> angry as it went on, because I just refuse to believe that those type of songs are genuinely stuff that... It's all subjective, right? But come on, man. Like, that song is so bad, and it's just... That sums up the issue with the soundtrack for me. It's one of these things where 
I, I don't think that song exists outside of GT. I sure hope it doesn't. And yeah, maybe it's just a case it of carrying it over and putting it in. But like, there's a few songs like that in here. Like, this is probably a controversial one for me. But Soul Surfer does my head in. Yeah, I don't um, like Soul Surfer either. I don't yeah. like, and, and that those two songs are very emblematic of like when they when Daiki Kasho or whoever tries to make a straight up rock song, it's not good. <laughs> like it's just I don't know. I'm sorry. I listen to like uh, this is gonna make me sound like such a fucking elitist asshole. I don't even want to say it, but it's just like I feel like this is um, a lot of the rock songs in Gran Turismo that are done by like hired artists for the game are kind of like public domain rock songs yeah and they're not i i love rock and punk and and all that kind of music i'm into it and it's just it's a, it's a, it's not there it's a level below yeah. <laughs> i'm sorry it's, 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 that, it's, it's dance dance revolution music that's how i'd describe it where <laughs> whereas like and and the reason that i say this and it's coming from a place of like disappointment rather than like full on like anger and this is shit is because like like the jazz music in Gran Turismo isn't like that. The jazz music is it it's I mean, I'm Fantastic. not a jazz aficionado, but like it's usually always very good. The lounge stuff is fantastic. They yeah. take a lot of inspiration from like Cassiopeia and T Square and it's it's very good. And then I don't know, the the, the rock songs just don't do it for me. Yeah. But the other thing too is that they were hyping up how they had like more than 300 songs in this game. Yeah. yeah. And on an objective level, like, can we be honest? Like, 270 of them are like carryovers. Yeah. Or yeah, like, 230 or something. You know, not quite that much. But like, I don't know. I thought that if they were really putting their, their foot forward with the music thing, that they're really going to push that, that they would have more new music. But there isn't a lot of new music in this game. Yeah, it's even the way you've got like the Gran Turismo 7 official album as well. Like, you see that coming out prior to release and you're like, oh well, they have taken a serious focus. But even that album, it's like seven new songs. Like That's it, yeah. There's you, not you a lot there. You could have included like, the, the title songs from the EU and NA versions of previous Gran Turismo games in there and stuff as well. Um, yeah, there's a few things they could have done on the music front and from a, a gameplay perspective as well, by the way, the constant changing of music between menu items, like, yeah, wow, yeah. what is going on? It's annoying. I don't know why every single menu uh, or, or location in the game needs to have its own, like, collection of songs. Like, can't the song that's playing in the world map play when I'm in Brand Central? Does it really need to... Because... The thing is, you're not always in those menus for more than like a second at a time, yeah. so it just like nothing persists, and I don't like that. Like, you know, maybe make an exception for like GT Auto because Gran Turismo has always done that. Yeah, but, like yeah, of course. for the most part, like it just things switch like way too fast because a lot of the time I'm like I'm popping like in and out of these menus, and it just adds friction to the game when the song keeps changing. <laughs> Yeah, I think it, this is also in part due to the PS5 loading times being insane. So I think mm. it's like that that just amplifies it further. But yeah, once again, very small issues that can be fixed. But there's times <laughs> where like, I think Nightbirds only ever plays when you're in the tuning menu. And I fucking love that song. So it's like I'll leave the game in the tuning menu for a bit. Yeah. But like when you're, when you're going about your regular gameplay, it's just constant music track changes. And I think that's a very kind of... Japanese game dev type thing like when you think of RPGs and stuff I think back to like Pokemon and stuff where you go in the Pokemon Center different tune, Pokemon Mart, different tune yeah, I think it's yeah. the same idea going on here but with those loading times man it just you, you never quite get to enjoy the music enough I feel like um, like you're saying GT Auto, fine Brand Central, we want to have that kind of premium feel, play whatever tracks are necessary in there but there's a few menus where you're like you, you could just continue playing the same overworld menu track or even resume it once you come back out of gt auto and stuff as well but the sound design is absolutely on point and fantastic that's just a tiny little gripe that i think i like that we still had time to talk about the soundtrack and get me to you know fucking lose my cool over i also like so that sorry, you uh man. you also <laughs> share in my hatred of dr awesome i remember i was trying to find the name of that song because i was yeah. like well, is it called it's probably called good times because that's like the one lyric i can hear in it right. and then when i saw dr awesome i played it i'm like oh my god this of it's course the, of the course the song is called dr awesome exactly <laughs> nobody can say we have straight face that 
Can you imagine you're at a party and you're like, mate, could you play Doctor Awesome? Can you, can you imagine saying that? Like, it's such a bad song, man. And listen, music subjective. Doctor Awesome is not. And I know we just got a little cancelled, probably some contingent. Yeah, of I think fans. I think that there were a lot of Gran Turismo fans that were enjoying this podcast up until about <laughs> five minutes ago, and now they want to kill us. So that's yeah, fine. Well, yeah. So, I mean, it's been a longer podcast than normal up to this point for a good reason. Because yes. the truth of the matter is, right, I, I watched many reviews of this game. I read your fantastic one on Jalopnik as well, Adam, which is now live and people Thank can read. Thank you. Uh, um, a week late uh, for, for <laughs> good reasons, but appreciate and it. It's, it's funny because you watched like a five, ten minute review of Gran Turismo and you do not envy the people reviewing these games at all because I still feel like after all this time and then this time discussing it there are still so many elements that you could probably talk at great length about like yeah. how many reviewers do you think even found out about the engine swaps for example or how many people found out about like, how the invitation system is kind of linked to the roulette wheel and stuff there's probably a lot of stuff that goes missing because the game is kind of about ex- exploration to a certain extent mm. so um and that's why, like, I, I understand, you know, it's easy to rag on the people who are just like, it's like The Sims, but with cars, and you go from menu to menu. And, like, I, yeah. you know, I, I, I always feel like if you can't sort of at least appreciate what the game is trying to do, then maybe, you know, if, if you go into it with the mindset of you're going to hate it and it's not for yeah. you, then maybe you shouldn't be reviewing that game. But, like, I can also understand, like, it's huge. And, like, reviewers don't have a lot of time to get through this shit you know i uh fortunately they got this one to us pretty early as far as i've i've you know Good. experience with getting some like pre-release codes like we had this game like a week a little bit more than that in advance but a lot of cases like you know to a little bit of like behind the behind the curtain stuff like when Codemasters uh, sends F1 codes, they usually do it like really late, like two days before the game comes out. And I want to like pull my hair out because there's no way that I could possibly <laughs> have anything useful to say about the game if I've only played it for like four hours. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's tough with a game like GT7. It's really big and there's a lot. Um, so, you know, I always, I always kind of lose it because as I'm writing, because I'm always worried I'm going to miss something that's really important. I'm sure I missed a bunch yeah. of things that are super important, but this is how it is. I think that's the the most important thing about this game for me in terms of its impact. Um, I have never seen like such fluid and constant discussion about a single game since we've had that Discord, and everybody like across 20 different users or however many can all add a little bit of individual insight about what they are doing at any given point and it probably isn't really related to what other people are doing so like everybody has that specific niche they like Gran Turismo for and they can talk towards it and and bring it up in discussion um and the the game is so big that it means that for somebody that'll be a learning point and I think that's the really cool thing about the game overall it's a it's a we we often say games are a platform, right? When they first launch, um, if they're online facing, especially like your Overwatches, that sort of thing. But those are like four maps, eight characters, whatever. Gran Turismo Seven is four hundred and twenty four cars or whatever, fifteen tracks, many different layouts, many different online modes of varying quality, um, and many other mission modes, licenses, that sort of thing. You've got the Pokedex type car collecting. There's just so many different avenues that they can expand this game on and, and naturally that means some will get more attention than others. That's the thing, you've got to set that expectation that some areas will be expanded on, some might stay relatively the same. But at the end of the day, like this, it is a true platform for car enthusiasts and people who just long for that old school racing game type of experience that just doesn't really exist that much anymore. And, And like I was saying earlier, there is that kind of clamour to try and say about how the economy might be getting twisted by microtransactions and stuff, but these have been here since GT5. Like, it's not something that (laughs) Polyphony is just dabbling into. They've always put this stuff in place and nobody ever uses it from what I can see. So, at the end of the day, I feel as if it's a a genuine design philosophy to make the game the way it is. Few questionable decisions in there, of course, like not being able to sell cars 
But generally speaking, this is an experience in line with what you wouldn't expect to see from a racing game in 2022. Yeah. There, there's a real schoolyard moment with this game. Uh, and what I mean by that is like, you know, remember when you were a kid kind of before the internet and like there was like a Zelda game or something like that and everybody was talking about like what they did to get past this level or this boss. Yeah. Um, everybody had a different story to tell. Everyone had a different road to get where they got to help each other. And I don't really see that with any racing game anymore. But it, I feel it a lot with GT7. And I think yeah. part of that is because it is naturally a weird game with lots of weird secrets and things to share. You know, if if you happen to get that uh, Chevy small block V8 and you, you got in the roulette wheel and then you put it in like a Miata, I'm going to ask you, like, how does that drive? Like, I want to yeah. fucking know. Because that's not something you can buy normally. And like... Yeah. That's cool. Or like if you're a new player, like I, I think that's part of it too. The air side is this game is so geared towards uh, educating people that naturally people who learn something want to talk about what they learned. Uh, and I'm actually surprised. I really I really thought that uh, people who weren't as familiar with Gran Turismo or cars, if they tried to play GT7, I thought they were just going to be put off by how slow it is. Uh, yeah. progression wise I thought that they were going to be really annoyed by all of like the uh, dialogue boxes and all that and I'm seeing that a little bit but not nearly to the extent that I thought I did like people genuinely yeah. seem to like to learn about cars which is a a gratifying thing to say as someone who's loved cars you know our whole lives um, so yeah yeah it's it's a it's a good time to be a fan and you know the game's only gonna get better from here so uh, at this point, I just look forward to those lobbies getting fixed up so we can oh, go racing again yeah. and, and shouting at each other because that always seems to happen for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're near enough getting to the point we need to put official statement letters on the Twitter account. <laughs> these, these GT First Days are going a bit crazy. Um, maybe we need to balance those out now with some bring what you've got sessions. No, I mean, I got, a, mm. I got an FC, FK engine, Civic engine yesterday. I put it in my... Um, EK Civic and mm. I'm just like oh, I want to drive this everywhere but I have nowhere to drive it to because it's not really that fast and it's not really that great handling <laughs> but um, I just love to like hoon it about online with some people so you know I mean that's the cool thing about GT7 as well I think it's going to bring back that kind of more freeform level of multiplayer that perhaps sport didn't encourage as much um, I think yeah. that there's potential for some good fun there just cruising around trial mountain and and making fake like multi-class races and that type of thing. Um, one of the things me and my pals used to always do on GT5 was like uh, cops and robbers lobbies. So you'd have yep, like somebody yep. in a supercar, have everybody else in the face cars, so you got to try and destroy it. Obviously the damage isn't mechanical in this game, I don't think, so you probably couldn't do it. But um, yeah, I, I love daft shit like that sometimes. It helps break the win on me, and I'm sure if it stops us going to the Nürburgring, you'll be happy about that as well. <laughs> I won't mind that. Yeah, one place you will never see me in the Nurburgring meeting room in Gran Turismo Seven. <laughs> uh, I, I like I I love the Nurburgring a lot. I think it's a really cool place. I just don't think it's a place that anyone should race in a video game online. That's that's my opinion. Leave that leave that to the professionals in the twenty four hour race. Yeah, I'd say that's yeah. fair. I'd say that's yeah. fair. But uh, yeah, I think that's just gonna just gonna about wrap it up for this episode. Um, I, I'm I'm really happy. I think we covered a lot. I think this has been a really fun chat about GT7, and uh, I think it's a predecessor for a lot of future chats that we're gonna have around <laughs> this game. Yeah. Uh, maybe when they when they start updating things and things start changing. So I look forward to it. And uh, everyone who's you know who's been playing the game, uh, a lot of you I imagine listening may already be aware of our Discord. But if you're not, uh, Go to Twitter, time underscore extend is our handle, and just DM us if you want an invite to our Discord, where a lot of people are talking about this game. Uh, if if you are starved for, you know, a community, uh, a, a sort of close-knit community that you can maybe actually follow with people you'll get to know, <laughs> and you want to yeah. talk about Gran Turismo 7 with them, it's it, there. as far as I know, there's no better place. So please, please come join us. Yeah, absolutely. Can only echo those statements. Very welcoming community. 
Um, we have some interesting things going on, like for example when embargo broke, Andy Hamilton did actually come into the the server and answered some NDA friendly questions and stuff mm. about the, the game, um, so we had like a kind of live Q&A thing going on there. Um, we have had kind of community nights on Grid Legends and stuff as well, some of the developers, that sort of thing, so... And amongst the, the general kind of homely chats and, and shit posting, there's also a, a good amount of pretty decent little events and what kind of discussions that go on in there as well. Um, so yeah, I can't recommend that enough. It's a, it's a great place to be, even if we're a bit biased and saying that. <laughs> yeah, well, they're listening to the show. They know what to expect. Thanks everyone for listening and enjoy GT7. Cheers, guys. Thanks for listening. Thank you.